so um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm Ed, I'm a d pro d director of product at uh, Rocket Internet. So I basically launch new businesses and help grow uh, businesses for, for Rocket Internet. And I'll tell you a bit about uh, what we do. Um, Rocket, well basically this talk is about why we launch businesses fast and how we launch them fast and some of the trade-offs that you have to make if you want to be really quick to get things going. So firstly, just to give you a quick intro about, about Rocket, if you, you haven't heard of it or perhaps uh, don't know what it's all about. Uh, basically, Rocket, we're in the business of making businesses. This, this bold statement was actually uh, given to me by my boss during my interview. He said, yeah, you want to join Rocket? We're in the business of making businesses. And what does that mean? I mean, it like, sounds great, right? It means this is sort of what we do, and I'll kind of talk you through this. So. Rocket does a couple of different things. It all starts with identifying businesses where we think there's opportunity, where, where we can have an impact. Um, and then, depending on whether there's a business already there or not, we might invest in it. And we do a lot of investments in other businesses through what we call the Global Founders Capital. It's the largest uh, investment fund or VC investment fund in Europe at the moment. And we also build a lot of our own businesses. So this, and this is sort of the rocket internet bit that, that that's actually known for. In both cases, we then have a lot of functional experts, everything from engineering, product, marketing, uh, operations, that can help scale those businesses and turn them into successful companies. So another way of thinking about this is if you were an entrepreneur, if you're doing this on your own, you're doing a standalone startup, it's a bit like working out of your garage. If you're doing it with Rocket Internet, because we're launching businesses a lot, we're growing a lot of businesses, then it's like working with a, you know, a pipeline, a uh, sort of more like industrial factory that's ready to go. And the idea here is that we industrialize the process of launching businesses, so that everyone we do, we get better at that process of launching businesses. Um, I work on the, I'll go back a bit, I work in this bit of the business, so launching new businesses mainly, and then supporting them in their very first few months uh, of life. And this year, this is, this is a selection of the businesses that we've launched this year. So when we say we launch a lot of businesses, um, it's probably nearly double this, but some of these are not public yet, some of them are internal projects for other businesses. Uh, so. The, the ones that we have announced so far for this year are these five. Campsy, which is a, a campsite booking platform. It's like hotels.com, but for campsites. Instafreight, which is a logistics business. Uh, it's a little bit like Uber for trucking, but not really. Uh, but I'll talk to you later about that if you're interested. Uh, Everdyne does frozen meals on a subscription basis. So if you don't like cooking, you can get a subscription of frozen meals sent to you. Bandist sells musical instruments, and Zinsgold is a uh, German fintech startup. It's a Festgeld startup, if you know what, what that is. So you see here quite a, a range of different industries that we work in and, and different products that we uh, work on. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about Campsy. I've actually worked on, on three of these. I work on Instafraid at the moment, and also I helped out a bit on, on Zinsgold as well. So typically, we say it takes us 100 days to launch a business. Like every business is a little bit different. It has its own needs, it has its own requirements. Um, but we have a few really big charts up on the wall uh, in the office, and they lay out what the sort of archetype of a launch should look like, and that's 100 days long. And that's for launching on both mobile native apps and uh, on the web um, if it needs it. So. Why do we launch that fast? Why, why would you try and launch a business in 100 days? Because that's quite a tight time frame. And this is the same lean methodology that everyone from Silicon Valley to Berlin is, is practicing. Like, the faster you have a real product, then the faster you can test it on real users, you can get data, you can learn from how people interact with it, and that will give you ideas on how to improve it. And you enter this cycle where you can continuously improve the product um, because you've got something real out in the wild, you've got real users giving you better and better ideas. To 
be a little bit more specific, then there are sort of these four categories of, of things or of tangible benefits that, that I thought of. So firstly, you've got your understanding of users. Like what do they actually want? What do they actually click on? Uh, what is the value that they, they really get? What are they really willing to pay for? You've also, secondly, got the unit economics. Uh, for us, a lot of the time, this is kind of a critical thing to whether the business is going to be successful or not, is whether the unit economics makes sense. So we can know that the product kind of makes sense from a theoretical point of view, but do we know that we can sell this product for more than we buy it for, and enough more than we buy it for to cover all the costs of running the business? Third thing is the industry profile. So as soon as you launch a business, then you will start getting a little bit of press, uh, a little bit of industry profile, and that can lead to some quite useful things if you're trying to build a business. So it can lead to investments, it can lead to suppliers, and it can lead to partnerships. And depending on what your business model is and how important those things are to you, then that can actually be quite a good reason to get something out to show that you've got an interest in this area and that you're bringing this particular angle to it so that people want to come speak to you. And finally, establishing a footprint. So a lot of the businesses that we deal with and a lot of tech businesses in general, uh, certainly if they're consumer facing, are local in the sense that one player can dominate a particular market or a particular market niche. So if you look at something like, say, Fedora, which is one of the businesses that we launched, and Deliveroo, they're, they're both locked in this kind of, or, you know, locked in this, this battle for each city. And probably one of those companies will win each major city in Europe. And we launched Fedora in 100 days because we wanted, oh no, uh, we wanted to win as many cities as possible. Like getting, getting out to market as quickly as possible was, was part of that job. The rest of this talk will mainly be about Campsy. So Campsy, as I said, is a bit like Booking.com, but four tenths. So you want to go camping, you don't go to Booking.com because they don't have any campsites, you go to Campsy. And Campsy is a business we launched this year. Uh, I was the product guy on it. We launched it in 28 days. So that's 28 days from me meeting the developers and meeting the rest of the team to us actually pushing it live and getting like real traffic on the, on the site. Um, that's the fastest that Rocket's ever done it. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about how, how do we do that. Yeah, it's pretty fast. Um, we cut some corners, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, so, but the, there's like one overarching thought to, to this talk, which is, which is ruthless focus. So, if you want to launch fast, and you want to launch really fast, then you have to be focused on just launching fast. And you have to be really focused on why you're launching fast, and how you're going to do it. And, again, to be a bit more specific, I'll break this down into five points, which kind of give a bit more detail on what I'm talking about. So, the first of these, the countdown, five. So, five. Uh, it, first one is work inside constraints. And I think this is probably the most important for me, is if you want to launch in a month, then you can't be going to engineers and saying, hey, how long is it going to take to build this feature? Because that'll tell you three months, or six months. You have to phrase it slightly differently and be like, hey, if we wanted to do this, what could you do for me in a week? And they'll probably say that that's a completely ridiculous timeline to do anything in, and they'd be right. Um, but if you say, yeah, yeah, but I know that's ridiculous, but anyway, what can we do in a week? They'll probably have an answer. And it's not going to be the three-month answer. It's not going to be the six-month answer, certainly. There's going to be a difference in quality there. But there'll be something you can do in that time that will then let you go live uh, that quickly if that's what you want to do, if that's what your focus is. So for Campsy, we decided it was really important to be especially fast, basically because of this graph. So this graph is taken from Google Trends. It shows indexed search volumes for camping-related terms through the year. So there's a whole bunch of terms kind of mixed into this, and they just stick it together as a report. But as you might expect, during the winter, so either end of the chart, not many people are searching for camping stuff because the weather's not that nice and no one wants to go camping. And in the summer, when the weather's nice, 
everyone's searching for camping because they want to go outside and be close to nature. So when we started thinking about Campsy, it was like the beginning of March. And uh, one, one question, how yeah. do you choose this, uh, this business? So the, the thing is, uh, did copy, you copy something, ideas in America, and you find out we have the time pressure because the American company do the same, so we have to copy this for, uh, for Europe? We, for, camp, uh, for this special Yeah, case. I mean, this is, this is something I mentioned a little bit later. So in this particular case, we saw a business called Hipcamp, yeah. which is a business in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And I'm not actually sure how that came on our radar. I think it was because they got uh, a round of, of funding, and then we started looking into camping in general. The more that we looked into camping, the more that we liked the industry, and didn't like it. So, so you don't find it you, uh, by yourself, you only do the, the rocket way, showing in other markets what is working, adapt this with your system, and try to uh, launch as fast. It's, it's a mixture, that's the typical way, I would mm -hmm. say, is that we, we see an area that we like because we see someone else doing something mm -hmm. similar. But I think increasingly it's, it's not doing exactly what they're doing, it's, it's being like, no, oh, it's hey, a, the market finding out the market. It's finding out about the market and then we look at the market and, and see what is the business that we want to build in that market. Okay. So um, there is product discovery. There is product discovery and that, that is the, the kind of the first chunk of that, that like series of arrows is the identified it. So there is a team looking for business models and trying to come up with them. But they also, you know, we have more mature businesses like Zalando or like Delivery Hero. Yeah, but, but they already copied from something you, you've seen in the market. But so they know their market so well that they're yeah. often actually spinning out new ideas. So that's another way we but can but identify Zalando has nothing to do anymore with Rocket, I think. It's independent now. I mean, certainly I, over the course of the past year, I've seen business ideas come out of Delivery Hero. So I use them as examples. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was the chart that I said, um, that made us think we wanted to do things particularly quickly. If we'd taken 100 days, that really long time, to launch a business, we would have launched about there, so June, middle of June, end of June. Um, but you can see that's already halfway through the camping season for the year. And at that point, we've then missed half of the, the camping season or like half of the feedback we can get for this year. So if it's going to be that late, then maybe we just take a bit longer and we do it next year. But if we do it next year, maybe someone else has done it, maybe we've got some better ideas. So actually, if we're going to leave it till next year, we probably wouldn't do this at all. But if we can do it in a month, we can launch here. And then we can see the feedback across the whole of the camping season and get you know, some real feedback on whether this is actually a business that, that we think has, has potential and we, we can continue to grow. So this is sort of like why we decided to push this uh, business particularly fast. Uh, how do we do that? We had a business already called Zen Rooms. So Zen Rooms is a booking platform for business hotels in Southeast Asia and South America. Uh, a business hotel booking platform is not a particularly good starting point for a camping website, as you might imagine. Like Business travelers and campers have different things on their mind. But it's similar enough that you can kind of do that. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and that is how you launch in 28 days. <laughs> um, you're coming up with some like, yeah, really dirty hacks to get something out the door that will work well enough that you get feedback on what's going. Because whatever you know, your camping website needs, it's gonna need some uh, catalog page like this where you can see all the campsites. And one that shows hotels is probably a good enough starting point. Like, we changed some of the, the filters and the sorting here, and that was like, yeah, but we, we really limited the bits of the business that we changed because it was gonna be way, way faster to get something out by taking existing sites and changing like, little bits of it, then building something from scratch, like, obviously. So all the payment shit was already there? Uh... We didn't launch with payments, oh. actually, but it was there. Um, yeah, and I'll talk because a little more about that. Yeah. I mean, they, they had basic payments and we decided for various reasons, not only product reasons, but also like business reasons, not to go with, with payments to begin with. Um, I mean, a lot of that was having like true availability from, from campsites. Um, 
one of the limitations that, that you have, and this is sort of like you know, living within the, they had this data structure where they group all their hotels by cities. Because if you're a business traveler and you're going to Singapore or Manila for a business trip, you probably don't care so much where in the city you're staying. You just need to be in that city for your, you know, for business. For, for camping, um, that's obviously not how you camp. We had to translate that model into something that worked for Germany uh, because we didn't have time to do anything else, which meant that all our campsites were arranged by German states. But you don't usually think about, oh, I want to go camping in Schleswig-Holstein this weekend. Like, that's not how you plan your camp trips. You sort of think about them, oh, maybe I want to go somewhere that's good for a family, or I want to go somewhere close to water. But we didn't have time to do this. This we did later. Um, so this was sort of like part of the, the bargain that we made with ourselves. It's like, well, if you want to get something out really quickly, we accept the fact that our data structure and the, the way that we group our campsites is not going to be ideal, uh, at least to start with. And we can fix that later, and that's fine, because this is not critical to the launch of the business. It's sort of, it's important, we'll get there eventually, but it's not a sort of a, a deal breaker. So, next point, answer specific questions. So, I mentioned like, we're, we're launching really fast because we want to get into the cycle of getting feedback off our users, and then using that to give us better ideas for how to improve the product. And a question when you're, when you're launching something is, oh, you're, you're building a, a minimum viable product, it's like, well, what is viable? Or like, what is the minimum viable product for that? Like, what features do you need, and which ones can you leave out? And the way that we answered this, uh, or thought about this a little bit, was by asking ourselves, well, what do we want to find out? Why are we launching so early? What are the questions that we want to know the answers to um, that make us decide whether we want to keep doing this or not, or, or how we need to change. So we've done some, uh, some desk research, like a, a week of kind of looking at the market, trying to understand it as much as possible. And off the back of that, we'd come up with a financial model. And that was obviously informed as well by our knowledge of marketplaces and travel and so on. And we realized there were two main assumptions in there that dictated whether the company was going to be viable or not. One was the cost per acquired user, uh, or CPA. And the other was the basket size. So when people booked a camping holiday, what was the typical booking size? Because obviously the lower the CPA and the higher the basket size, then <coughs> the more money you make on each booking and the better your unit economics are. So, to test each of those, though, you need quite a small subset of, of features. For, for CPA, you need a landing page. You just need like a basic landing page where you can drive traffic to, and then you see how much it costs to drive every person to that, to that landing page, and then to do something on it. So we've got this uh, search bar, and you can put in your basic dates there. And then this page just went through to the catalog, which I showed before. And the catalog that we then had a detail page where you can see details of the campsites, and then you've got a booking form. So the booking form here, yeah, it doesn't have payment. We cut that out. Um, time constraints again. Later. Sorry? You get it from the campsite later. Exactly. We gathered customer details. We basically get them to fill in all their details, and then we go to the campsite and be like, hey, someone wants to book with you. Uh, do you want to pay us 20 euros for, for their details? And so we kind of figured out we, we didn't actually need to take cash off the user to start with. We'd still have a really good indicator of whether people were going to spend money and how much they were going to spend. Like how many nights were they going to book for? How much, uh, like what was the cost per night and all the extras they wanted um, to give us an indication of this. You can see it still says this is actually the design um, rather because I couldn't find a shot of the site live. So it's still got the Indonesian currency or whatever that we took from. <laughs> that we took from Zendrins in it. So, third point, align and delegate. And what I mean here is, if you're doing something quickly, then it's really important, and you're doing it in a team, uh, very, very important that you align on the big topics, and you all know sort of the vision of what you're delivering. But once you've agreed the big topics, then you really need to make the most of every team member. So delegate stuff to them and let them get on with it. 
From how many people are we talking here now? I give me two slides okay. and I'll be right there. So for us, the like the big questions that we needed to line on was the business model. So um, yeah, HipCamp, uh, I say was the the reference model we saw in the in the US was a bit like Airbnb for, for camping. So it had this idea where if you owned a farm or you had a bit of extra land, then you could put online some camping site spots and maybe some people would want to come along and book them. Um, but we, we realized that kind of wasn't, or we didn't think it would work that well in Europe because Europe's a lot smaller, it's a lot more densely populated, it didn't seem there'd be like as many people with um, as much space for camping. So we also thought about what the other business models might be because we thought we could see that camping was a big market and so it felt like something should work there. So we talked a lot about kayak, um, whether we should be an aggregator just sending leads to, uh, to campsites. Um, but a lot of campsites just didn't really have any web presence or had a very poor web presence. So then we also looked at, at booking.com where we were actually doing uh, eventually processing the payments and having the profiles of the campsites. Um, and you know, as we talked about it more, we got more and more comfortable that we wanted to be the booking.com of camping. That was where we felt the, the, the industry, the market really needed us and where we could make most money. So that's kind of like, once we aligned on that, then this is the team that we started off with. So I was doing the, the CPO role, the interim CPO role. We had a tech lead uh, and two devs. The tech lead, his wife had a baby during the three, during the four week period as well. So that, and he, I think he took, took a couple of days off. He was really keen. He was more interested in launching the website actually, bizarrely, because it's his second child. Um, <laughs> we had a uh, head of ops who was in charge of reaching out to all the campsites, getting them interested, getting content for the website. And then we had a marketing person helping out with you know, how are we going to drive traffic here, what are all the keywords we need, what campaigns we need to run, make sure we had all the assets ready. And between us kind of starting getting things going and us actually going live, we added a couple more people. So we added a CEO um, who was otherwise engaged until about a week before launch and an intern to help out on the content. And once we were live, then uh, the team obviously grew. But um, yeah, it was, both a small team, but it was also, it was very focused what everyone on that team was doing. So when we kind of agreed that, okay, we're gonna be the camp, uh, booking.com of, of campaign, then that was a, a big team discussion. But then the details of the marketing plan, I wasn't giving any feedback to the CMO, but you know, I could do, she wasn't giving me so much feedback on what the checkout should look like. Um, the way that we made this work was we ran Scrum across the entire business. So not just in the tech team, but also across operations, marketing, finance, you know, company, setting up the actual company itself. Um, and that, that proved so successful that the company still runs it today, like across the whole company. Um, CEO would never use it before. He'd be so proud. Uh, so uh, it's, it's grown a bit. This is the board they actually have today. So we now have like three different boards. It's split up a bit more, it's a bit more detailed. We started with uh, just one board and kind of like dividing it up. But that meant that you know, when we had topics like who's gonna register the company and we didn't have a CEO, then we could just make sure that someone was gonna take care of that and actually see that it was done. Um, and it also, the you know, same reason you'd use a, a scrum board normally to kind of track what are, the, what are the issues upcoming, make sure no one's blocked, make sure that everything kind of runs smoothly. Uh, second, second point, second step, fourth step on the count now. Uh, so innovate efficiently, and this is like this is the flip side of work within constraints, or it's the, I guess it's also the complementary bit of answer specific questions. This is saying, if you're going to launch a business and you're going to be different, uh, and you've got to be different because otherwise someone's doing what you're doing, then you're going to have to innovate somewhere, and you should probably innovate efficiently though in the sense that innovate where you need to and make sure you do innovate there, but don't innovate everywhere. Innovation is expensive, it requires time, it requires going and speaking to customers and of going around like iterate, you know, iterating on your designs and so on. So if you want to launch super fast, 
you can't do that everywhere. And probably you don't need to do that everywhere. But there are certain places where you do need to do it. So, I was talking about HipCamp. Like, we looked at the model there. We could have just copied HipCamp, like, you know, page to page, and, and launched it. Uh, we didn't because when we looked at it, we realized it just wasn't right for Europe. In the US, uh, you've got a lot of national parks. They're run by these guys. They have their own booking platforms. Um, you've got, this is what their HipCamp's uh, website looks like, but you can see that this is the bit here where they've got, hey, do you want to list your own property? Because lots of people have got their own property. And this is on a, I think, probably can't read it. This is on a, on a farm because someone's got a guest house on their farm, so that, that's what they want to do. And we're like, wait a second, this doesn't feel like it's going to work in Europe quite as well. And this is also sort of the image of a lot of uh, camping in, in the US, where you don't need a lot of facilities because a lot of people have RVs, and it's all about the landscape you're in. And when we looked at Europe, we are like, wait a sec, a lot of this is about the facilities that are there. It's about going somewhere where the kids have three different swimming pools to play in, and there's a kids club, so you can go to the beach. Um, so, yeah. That's, we, we started realizing that maybe taking everything direct from HitCamp was not going to be such a good idea. We thought, okay, well, we want to launch fast. We can basically do a generic booking travel site. We've, we've got Zen Rooms. We'll base it on that. Um, but we also realized that they had a very typical checkout for a hotel. So up here, you can see you put in your start date, your end date the number of uh, guests that are staying, the number of rooms that you want, as you might do on any typical site for, for booking hotels. Again, this doesn't really work for camping. When we looked at the price lists for campsites, they look like this. Mm -hmm. Camping is probably, it was the most complicated pricing model I've, I've ever seen. In Germany, I especially. Think <laughs> Germany. In, yeah, especially in Germany. So <laughs> you have, different prices for adults and children, and everyone will define a child as something different. You know, is it 16, is it 14, is it 13? Uh, you have to pay an extra price for your dog, or multiple dogs, if you want to take a tent, or a caravan, or a, um, a camping van. That's all different. If you want an electricity hookup, or a water hookup, all of this is then seasonal, and not just seasonal in blocks, but also by public holidays and fete days. <laughs> Uh, and then you know you've got some premium spots that are next to the lake, and some less premium spots that are you know free form. It's not not kind of marked out areas. It was crazy. So we realised like, firstly, going with the Zen Rooms model was not going to work at all. And secondly, like we weren't going to capture all of this complexity in one go. So we boldly uh, narrowed this down to these fields basically. So we still have the date ones, which I kind of cut out at the top. Uh, we've got adults and children, and we just blanket the fine. We're like, right, for us, children are under 16. Everyone else, get with the program. Um, and the type of camping. So tent versus caravan versus RV. And, and this, it didn't capture all of the, the pricing variation that you see there. But it captured, we felt, like 80% of the variation. Because then when you're talking about, oh, well, it's May and it's not June, or actually my child is 15, they're not 13. This was sort of, it was a euro here or there. So we sort of, we pushed everything up a little bit. We're like, hey, for, you know, 90% of people, we're going to be within 5% of their price. And we're probably actually going to get back in touch with them when we've confirmed it with the campsite and say that we can give them a small, a small discount on the price. So, but this, I mean, this was the bit of the site where we put most thinking into and most innovation. It doesn't look like a lot because we only had a month to launch. So there was a limited amount that we could do. Now that we've been uh, live for six months, then this is what the pricing looks like. And again, you can see it's, it's completely different. And this then has a lot more detail behind it in the, uh, in the back end, which captures a lot of the data that the campsites are sending us. And we have a campsite portal where they can upload all their data so that this then accurately reflects the pricing, more or less, that you would have saw a couple of pages ago. But this was not something that we could build in four weeks. Um, yeah, I guess the point here, as I say, focus on where you need to innovate. And the stuff like the, the catalog where you can see all the different campsites, like, 
we can make some improvements there, but they're not going to be material to whether this succeeds or not in the same way as innovating on the price list here. So we, we decided to focus on the price list and just take the, the catalog page one for one from Zenrooms. Final point here, accept limitations. And this whole talk has basically been about cutting corners. Uh, the final point is about sort of, you know, accept the limitations that that gives you and, and you know, don't beat yourself up about the quality uh, being a little bit lower than you'd normally expect it to be. So um, for us in particular, we had limited functionality, so we didn't have payment and checkout. Uh, we had a lot of manual operations, so initially when we were taking bookings, the ops people would see an order come in, basically as an email, they'd then have to call the campsite, confirm the price, confirm the availability, go back to the camper, send them an email with a confirmed price and dates, and then receive a, an email from the camper that confirmed those dates, confirmed that price, because that was then the legally binding bit, and then reconfirm it actually with the campsite. So. It was a hugely laborious process for them, uh, which now is a lot more automated and streamlined, but that's where it started and that was fine because you know, we knew we'd start with just a few orders and part of doing that manual process would teach us what we needed to automate and how to automate it in future. And technical debt, so things like uh, you know, the way that we structured the campsites, were they in uh, states in Germany or, or were they sort of tagged in some different way? Like, these were things that we, we gradually untangled over time after we launched. But again, it was, it was something that, as we launched, was good enough to, to actually get some orders and see if the business had traction. And, and I think all the way through this, like, we got orders uh, within a week of launching, and then they grew pretty much every week throughout the summer. So even taking all the shortcuts that we did, it, we pitched it about right in the sense that we did immediately start getting orders. And yeah, sure, when we uh, changed around the, the search criteria and put a map on there that you could search by location on, on the map rather than by state, then conversion might double or something ridiculous. Uh, but even what we started with was good enough. So that was it. So five points, all about ruthless focus, basically. Just being like really uh, focused on what you're launching, when you're launching, why you're doing that, um, answering specific questions, uh, and getting on with it, and then sort of accepting that you have chosen specifically to not do some things well so you can get out fast. And then getting live so that you can learn more and continue to up uh, to improve things. That's it. That's it. Thank you.